I don't know if any of you are here. I gave this talk once before to this group. And it's been, I don't know, right before the chartering. How many of you were here that night that I gave it? I was trying to remember. Okay, so about half of you. So um, the, the talk hasn't really changed, but I think what did change, I don't, did I bring the artifacts with me the last time? Did I? Okay. So I couldn't remember if I did that. But, but you mentioned that uh, there was a 1908 badge that they made up. And uh, I actually came across an example about five or six years ago and was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to buy it from a fellow. The fellow that sold it to me rarely sells any of this stuff. And um, for some reason, he felt like it needed to go home with me. So uh, we struck a deal right there at the Lexington Coin Show about six or seven years ago. But um, anyway, I got interested in this because of the badge. Um, Want to know more about the 1908 reunion that the North Carolina Division held here in Winston-Salem. And so just on a whim, I went over to the Forsyth County Library, and I'd heard that they had all the Winston-Salem journals back to when the Winston-Salem journal started back in the 1880s or 90s. It was called the Western Sentinel or something, you know, but it evolved into this Winston-Salem journal. And uh, so I went over there and started going through their microfiche, and I knew sort of the dates that this thing was held, and I sort of went in there and zoomed back and. Lo and behold, I started finding headlines and stories that led up to the event and then the three days of the event there. You know, it was the front line, and I'll show you some copies of this, but it was the, the big event in town and had the, the number one headline on the front page of the winston Salem Journal for three straight days. If you could picture something like that today, it's just, yeah. you know, it's hard for us to relate. But uh, I'll share some of that. And uh, what I tried to do with this talk, I just tried to piece together some things. So I'm going to read a little scripted thing I did, but it's based on all those newspapers that I came across and some of the information that was in there. And I, I really found a lot of stuff in there that uh, I, I don't have in here, but I have some copies of some of the things that I photocopied. And then, uh, you know, it was really tough with the technology they have with there. I couldn't get digital images. So I had to just sort of print it off as I went through it. So my intention is to go back over there and figure out some way to get some digital images. And so what I did, which they turned out pretty good in the PowerPoint, you'll see um, some of the headline pages, the banners and stuff, I was able to scan them in and they, they look pretty decent for you know, putting in a PowerPoint. So um, with that said, um, the one thing that struck me about the 1908 reunion I think it was the largest UCV division reunion in North Carolina that was ever held. Even the ones after it and the ones before, it was the, the high watermark of reunions in North Carolina. Um, a lot of the, uh, the, the communities that tried to host it later, they always pointed to the Winston-Salem event as the one that everybody compared to. So I found that sort of interesting. But 1908 was three years after they placed the monument here downtown. So I think there was probably a reason why they sort of timed it the way they did. Um, Jamie and I talk about postcards all the time, and I collect postcards, and I've got a handful of that monument from like the early 1900s. And I think I actually, I might have to pull this out a little bit just to try to see if I can. I was going to pull it back so I could get the image as large as I can for you guys. And let me see if I can, I may have to raise it a little bit. Let me see. Always got a plan B. We'll grab this and see if I can just set the projector up on here. If that'll help. Okay. So now I'm gonna try one more time to make it bigger. <laughs> Let's see if I can focus. It looks a little grainy because the wall is grainy. Um, Dates of the reunion. Do you um, I've got them. Uh, it'll come out in the talk. I okay. can't remember. It was August 18th or 19th, somewhere in there. Oh, that's fine. But, um, and I know I can't do this without my glasses. So let me, um, let me start into this, and, and this will probably take us about 20 minutes to go through this, but um, I was looking real quick when the actual date was. It started on the 18th and went through the 19th and 20th. So, okay. 
So I've got a little lead in here, and I did this talk. I geared it both for the audience here tonight and for general audiences. So there's some things in here y'all go like, yeah, yeah, get on with it. We know all this, right? So um, I'll just jump in here. It says, following the end of the war between the states, North Carolina, as well as other southern states, was placed under military occupation for several years. During this time, Confederate veterans were mostly barred from gathering in the public. For these men, it was uh, certainly a bittersweet return to normal life. For many old-timers and veterans, the memories of Reconstruction were far more distasteful than the end result of the war itself. However, the restrictions on the gathering of Confederate veterans were lifted as the Northern occupation came to an end in the 1870s. By the 1890s, the old, old veterans began to exercise their restored rights as they gathered at reunions to reminisce of the old times together and to honor those who had made the ultimate sacrifice for the lost cause. For this purpose, the United Confederate Veterans was formed as a national organization with divisions at the state and uh, local levels, consisting of hundreds of local camps. By the early 1900s, however, many of the old veterans who had survived the war had become advanced in age or had already passed through this world into the next. With their ranks rapidly being depleted with each passing year, they began to look to their other organizations such as the sons and the daughters to carry their memory and true history. Um, see if I've got... Okay, I'm going to try to keep up. This is actually a photograph from Winston-Salem, and I'll, there's some in here that aren't, but uh, this one is uh, from one of the first known gatherings of the veterans. <clears throat> and uh, uh, in North Carolina, the veterans were that were able continued to attend local, state, and national reunions. Winston-Salem hosted his share of state-level UCV reunions in 1894, and I think this may be the 1894 gathering. Um, it was just a, a local gathering, I think. But 1898, 1908, 1912, 1923, and then the last one held here was in 1930. And I actually have some photographs of some houses that were decorated in Winston during the 1930. The National UCV reunion was held in Charlotte in 1929. And you see sometimes on eBay, you'll see some of those badges out there. Uh, <clears throat> uh, tonight I'd like to share some information about and highlight the 1908 North Carolina UCV reunion held in Winston-Salem. And it was absolutely a grand affair with most of the information on it available from 1908 issues of the Winston-Salem Journal. While the paper copies no longer exist, they have been placed into microfiche at the main branch of the Forsyth County Library in downtown Winston. These records give us a good glimpse into the days of August of 1908. And I was fascinated with some of the things I found. So I'll flip through here. This is actually uh, the 1898 parade and this is downtown there and uh, you can sort of see what things look like uh, but there was a huge crowd out there and you can see uh, Victorian looking ladies hanging out but um, this is uh, off a of digital Forsyth I believe I can't remember where I got I think it is <clears throat> but anyway um, I'm gonna show uh, a place you're familiar with this is where uh, we do the memorial every year uh, with the ladies uh, here in Winston. And uh, I'll jump over here. We'll talk about this real quick. Planning for the reunion began early in the spring of 1908 with final preparations in full swing by July. The host UCV camp based in Winston-Salem was named in honor of Lieutenant Marmaduke Williams Norfleet, Company C, 47th Regiment, North Carolina Troops. North Carolina roster states that he was a good soldier and a Christian gentleman. His grave is located in the Salem Cemetery in Old Salem. And this is his grave here. And actually, uh, there, there was some problems with that uh, uh, UDC marker, so they put it in the top of the monument. People kept stealing them, so they embedded it in the top of the monument. And I don't know exactly when that was done, but that's sort of directly behind that place where we do the memorial every year. I don't know. Does everybody know where that grave is? Okay. Um, so. Uh, the camp took the lead, worked with Major uh, Mayor Eaton and the aldermen of Winston, the Salem Commissioners, the North Carolina UCV, and other UCV camps, UDC, and local businesses to organize the event. The work was divided up into various committees as the city made ready to receive the anticipated 1,500 to 2,000 veterans and 1,500 guests. So that's a bunch of people. Where do they put them? 
The objective was clearly to give the old veterans the time of their lives, and that's what they tried to do. Uh, the reception committee alone had no less than 60 participating members with local veterans and prominent citizens including General William R. Boggs, Dr. H. F. Schaffner, Colonel Henry, Francis Henry uh, Fries, Frank H. Vogler. Uh, other committees were formed to take care of programs, transportation, commissary, accommodations, quartermaster duties, the parade, music, decoration, carriages, badges, finance, and the Bureau of Information and a place where you could go if you just wanted to know more information. So this was a really a big operation. Um, additional notable names on these committees included P.A. Haynes, people know who that is, uh, Tom Bloom, Julius Lineback, B.J. Fole, J.S. Scales, F.J. Liffert, and you'll hear more about those two fellows here in a minute, R.C. Norfleet, and George Nissen. Um, all of these fellows served North Carolina during the war and many of them in, are interred at that Salem Cemetery. Literally hundreds of folks served on the committees, cluing us into the magnitude of the occasion. Accommodations had to be made for the hundreds of visiting veterans. And I think I have some pictures. Uh, you see that warehouse over there with the steeple on it? That was one of the warehouses, a tobacco warehouse, where they actually housed some of these veterans. So they made room for them. A lot of them didn't have a place to stay. There's another view of it. I've got several pictures here of it. The Brown Warehouse, which is that one down there on the right, was ready for about 800 of them. The Eagles Lodge pitched in as well as boarding establishments and, res and, and residents. The Piedmont Warehouse was ready and held in reserve. I think I got pictures of it in there somewhere. Um, and you can see there's a lot of covered wagons during that period of time, not many vehicles. This is a tobacco season when, when you see these wagons a lot. You see them on postcards. Um, what street is that? I think that's Fourth Street. Uh, Main, Street Main North Okay, Main Street. Yeah, that's right. Because they they intersect. But uh, this is Main Street, and um, I don't know if the building's still there. I can't. I don't think it is. But um, anyway, I've got some other pictures here. So uh, here is a, a advertisement. Uh, M W Norfleet. Um, of the Piedmont warehouse, he actually owned the warehouse there. Um, so he was already, let's see, this was, um, I forget when this was dated, 1880, that's right. So, you know, he passed on way before this. So this, this he was the one that sort of started this warehouse um, and that, that became a sort of place for the, the veterans. And there's another picture of it as well. Um, this is the Piedmont warehouse. Meals were also planned and included large quantities of fresh food. For example, 1,500 pounds each of roast beef and boiled ham were brought in, as well as 3,000 loaves of bread. Volumes of fresh garden vegetables were supplied by local markets. Special efforts were made to order up about 800 large watermelons. You ever seen that many watermelons in one place? Uh, and placed in cold storage for the anticipated watermelon feast on Wednesday afternoon. So they, they had an actual time where they actually cut watermelons and gathered over there in the square. Just like old times. Uh, about 1,800 badges were prepared by the Norfleet camp for the occasion. These badges would be handed out to the veterans as special mementos. And I don't know, I'll get to these guys in a minute. Um, they also had to be warned to gain access to special lodging, prepared meals, and rides on the trolleys throughout the city. They, they had a, these new fangled things called electric trolleys that were powered from the Yadkin River down there at, at the river. So they had, they had this electricity bought in. The reason they put the dam out there on the Yadkin River was to power these trolleys initially. That was the project that, that put that on the board. The idols down. I learned that later. Okay, so I'm gonna get sidetracked here. Um, so anyway, uh, these badges were highly prized and to be worn only by the veterans, right? So uh, I actually have one of these here tonight and uh, uh, I'll pass that around here in a second. Um, I was told at one time that maybe only five or six of them exist. So one of them's hanging over there at the lighthouse and I know, um, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of his name. One of the other fellows that, that used, that's in the Norfleet group. Uh, mm. I'll think of his name here in a minute, but he used to organize the, the Civil War show over here at the Elks Lodge. Oh, Mike Cummings? Not Mike. 
It'll come to me. It'll come to me. But anyway, he has one. Um, so I'll tell you what, I might just go ahead, while I'm talking, I'll just pass this thing around because I've got another piece that I'll pass around too. But I've got it in a case, so don't worry about handling it. It's right there. It's got the celluloid and the actual Confederate flag to go with it. Um, so um, the Winston and Salem bands, along with some of the older veteran, mu veteran musicians prepared for the anticipated grand concert on Wednesday evening at the Salem Square. The Twin City responded to the calls to decorate homes. And I think I have a picture. This is from the 1930, but this is one of the, the Reynolds homes. The, the R.J. Reynolds uh, home, I think, and this is the uh, wife and the children there. But you can see huge flags. I would love to see what the colors look like on this. I wish we had a color photo, but this is on digital for sight. But uh, Twin City responded to the calls to decorate homes and businesses, especially along the parade route. A large assortment of battle flags of all sizes were made available through the Masonic Lodge. Many of the more elegant homes were decorated with large Confederate and battle flags to honor the veterans. So if you can imagine, some of the streets were probably lined uh, back in those days. Uh, carriages and teams of horses were called up through the area to help transport the disabled veterans for much of the anticipated parade route. And then uh, this is where they actually came in. I don't know if this photo is period or not, but it's pretty close to what the railroad station would look like when these guys were arriving. So um, all was set in motion by the morning of August 18th, 1908. The town was abuzz with excitement. By that evening, nearly 500 veterans had already arrived. By mid-morning on Wednesday the 19th, the, the veterans began pouring into the Winston train station from all over North Carolina. Uh, recorded people coming in from Wilkesboro, Mount Airy, Moxville, Salisbury, Thomasville, High Point, Greensboro, Reedsville, Charlotte, Durham, Wilmington, and Raleigh. Name, I, I couldn't name them all. The Army arrived on the scene in force, much as it did 47 years earlier at Manassas Junction on a similarly hot, humid day in the July of 1861. The Wednesday morning Winston-Salem Journal headline boldly proclaimed, Winston-Salem welcomes the survivors of the bravest armies that ever trod the earth, 1,500 heroes to share Twin Cities hospitality. Vanguard of Confederate Army enters Winston-Salem without effort. Hundreds more to arrive from all over North Carolina. Could you imagine that today? See a headline like that and all these, you know, sons of Confederate veterans pouring in. These were actual veterans, you know. It's, it's hard to really, it, it has to sink in a little bit to realize that you're talking about 1,500 of the real guys marching downtown Winston-Salem. Uh, the heroes of the grandest armies that ever faced a foe began pouring into Winston-Salem early yesterday for the reunion. As each train was emptied of its load, the soldier boys marched to the courthouse where they were registered and taken charge of by the various committees. It was the vanguard that stormed the city yesterday and the Grand Army, nearly 1,500 strong, will conquer all today and tomorrow. So they, it was a big deal. Um, you, you might have recognized these fellows as Major Strunnock gave out badges. Um, whoops, jumped ahead of myself. Among the mo notables to arrive yesterday afternoon was General Julian S. Carr of Durham, Major H.A. London of Pittsburgh, Colonel W.T. Wood of Randolph County, and Major A.B. Strunnock of Raleigh. Accompanying Major Strunnock and his 26 members of the LOB Branch Camp of Raleigh was the old Confederate Drum Corps. And that's some of these guys here. From the courthouse to the Piedmont warehouse, the Corps marched, played their airs to a delighted crowd. The Corps is the only organization of its kind in the South. So this is a direct quote from the newspaper at the time. Uh, as Major Strunnock gave out badges, uh, here's an here's a actual, probably that's probably what the courthouse looked back then. Um, as Major Strunnock gave out badges, Pfeiffer Johnson asked him, will this admit you to whiskey too? He knew that the badges were good for a lot of things. Can we get some whiskey with it? He said, it will entitle you to anything, replied Dr. H. F., uh, H. V. Horton, a local dentist. All right, flashed another old veteran. I want you to make me a set of teeth before I leave here too. <laughs> uh, you can imagine. That was probably good news for him. So um, Wednesday, um, 
Here's another picture of the courthouse. Wednesday would indeed be a full day of activity for the veterans. The opening meeting would be held in the Elks Auditorium at 10 a.m. on that morning. The meeting was called to order, and uh, I think I have a picture. There's some of the, the band. And this is from the 1917 um, National UCV. I just found some pictures, but that's probably what some of these fellows would have looked like. There's the badge sort of the badge is circulating around. But this is a picture of the actual uh, Elks Auditorium and it actually burned uh, after, after this sometime. I think it was 1916 that that actually burned and was sort of destroyed. Uh, the meeting was called to order by General Julius Carr, commander of the North Carolina Division UCV. There were present several hundred of the veterans, scores of dollars of the Confederacy and other visitors. The Elks Auditorium was filled with a fresh, happy, and expectant crowd. And they, these are words from the, from the journal. After a rendition of America by the band, Bishop Ronthaler led the assembly in an invocation of divine blessing. And he was like the head guy of the Moravian Church in North Carolina at the time. And he, he was over the, uh, the home church there. Honorable Cyrus B. Watson for the Northfleet Camp then welcomed his comrades to the Twin City in a whole souled hearty speech that hit the spot with the old boys who showed their appreciation by a burst of applause and cheering as Mr. Watson took his seat. Major O.B. Eaton figuratively turned the keys of the city over to the veterans in a graceful and appropriate speech. So they gave the keys of the city to these old Confederate guys. Major H.A. London responded to the addresses of welcome and assured that words were not necessary to make the old soldiers feel the welcome that the Twin City had extended them, declaring that the evidence of it were on all sides. He declared that the old soldiers were already at home and were enjoying themselves to the fullest during their stay. As Major London resumed his seat, the United Band struck up Dixie, and the scene that followed is long to be remembered. Gray-bearded men sprang from their seats on the floor and on the stage and cheered the strains of music which they had scores of times heard mingled with the scream of shot and bursting of shells. General Carr on the stage was an inspiration, magnificent in his gold-braided uniform of Confederate gray. With his snow-white hair and mustache, he looked as if he felt the excitement of battle with his hands raised to the heavens, cheering the glad, lively battle song. The whole audience apparently forgot that more than 40 years had passed, and it was several minutes before the demonstration finally died down. I could just imagine, you know, they, they got excited. Um, a pleasing feature of the meeting was a short, snappy, and appropriate speech by General C. Irving Walker, commander of the Department of the Army of Northern Virginia. He brought the house down when he proved conclusively that the Yankees were the rebels in the 60s. He said that from the standpoint of the Constitution and the teachings of the men who built the Republic, the South was right and the North was wrong. This is the Winston-Salem Journal. The Winston-Salem Journal is declaring this. Uh, in other words, the North, the North departed from the teachings of the founders of the Republic and the writers of the Constitution, and they were the rebels. I, I just, those words jumped out at me from the, from the paper. In closing, he also paid a beautiful tribute to the women of the Confederacy for the part they took place in the struggle. The meeting would be followed by a dinner uh, from 12.30 to 2 p.m. at Brown's Warehouse. The annual election of North Carolina Division UCV Officers would be conducted at 3 p.m. in the Elks Auditorium, followed by the watermelon feast at, at Brown's Warehouse at 5 p.m. Supper, supper would be served from 6 to 7.30 p.m. The day would end with a grand concert on the Salem Square at 8 p.m. by the combined Salem and Winston bands. Unfortunately, the concert had to be moved indoors to the Elks Auditorium due to inclement weather. Nonetheless, a lively selection of 15 songs included favorites such as the Old North State. Anybody know that tune? It's a beautiful song. The Washington Grays, the Sentinel, the Bonnie Blue Flag, Chilcothian, and of course, Dixie. The evening was ended with a moving rendition of Taps. And I think, uh, okay. So, Thursday morning, August 20th, 
Winston-Salem Journal summed up the activities from Wednesday and pointed to the events that lie ahead on Thursday. The headline read, Twin City entertains biggest gathering of Confederate veterans in history of the Old North State. All officers were re-elected yesterday. More than 2,000 old soldiers and 1,000 other visitors are here. Keys of the city are turned over to them. And uh, also, it, it has to be noted that all the banks in the city were closed on account of the reunion. And uh, here's a little thing in the newspaper I found. And a grand parade plan for mid-morning. It would begin on West 5th Street, and with the thousands of participants, logistics would require staging from several other connecting streets. They were organized into three divisions. <laughs> so they're, they're organizing an army in the streets of Winston-Salem. Um, this is another picture down, and you see the actual Confederate monument. This is where it used to be out there by itself before the courthouse crept up on it, right? So um, the first division was marshaled from Cherry Street. First in line was the advanced guard of mounted police, followed by General Carr and his staff, the Salem Band, speakers, and the daughters, and the Forsyth Riflemen, which was actually an organized group of guys that you probably would have some ties to, right? The Forsyth Riflemen were the actual Forsyth Rifles. You know, when they when they started, they were originally called the Riflemen, and then they shortened it to Rifles. Um, the second division started from Pine Street with Generals Ray and Carlton at the head. Next in line was the old Veterans Band, visiting camps of UC, UCV veterans, then the North Fleet camp, followed by disabled veterans in carriages. And this is the 1917 reunion in D.C. This is not Winston-Salem. But I just found these pictures that they sort of illustrate what, what I'm trying to describe here. Um, the third division began from Spruce Street with General Lund Generals London and Metz at the head of the column. The Winston Band came next, followed by the J.B. Gordon chapter of the Daughters of the Confederacy. Bringing up the end of the column were the Winston, -Salem, Winston and Salem Fire Companies. And this is an actual picture of them and that's on digital for Scythe. I thought that was really cool. Um, the parade route would go up 5th to Summit, countermarch back to Cherry, down Cherry to Shallow Ford. This is another fellow, this is uh, 1917. Um, interesting fellow there. Um, but it would go down Cherry to Shallow Ford, then to Main Street, Salem, back up Main Street to 3rd, then up Liberty to Auditorium. It was an impressive sight as the streets were packed with veterans. At the time, it was believed that the, com the parade comprised a larger number of old soldiers than had been in the ranks together in North Carolina since the war. So they had, this was the largest gathering of veterans since the war ended. Um, this is 1917 too, but what struck me about this picture is there's two things in there. You see a Tar Heel banner, and what else do you see in the picture? Hornet's Nest. Hornet's Nest. I don't know if you can tell. I might have to, right there? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> that guy doesn't seem to be too excited about carrying that thing. He looking on his look on his face. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, well, g guess what? These guys, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but the UCV reunion was done so at the invitation of the GAR. They invited them to come up and actually do this in Washington, D.C. So there was a, sort of a, a spirit of cooperation back then, you know, between all these fellows. So here you got the North Carolina contingent, and this is, this is 1917. Um, anyway, the entire line of march was a scene of animated and cheering humanity, with the line being almost a mile long. At 945, the parade moved, moved sl smoothly, and steadily through the streets, solid masses of people flanked the army on either side. Along the way, the veterans marched to stirring music. And this is an actual um, earlier, uh, this is Winston-Salem, and this is another gathering there. And I don't think this was actually a, a veterans reunion. This was actually a, 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 a school outing. There was some kind of school thing going on there. So there's a lot of school children out there. But the photo is pretty clear of where that is. Um, Anyway, um, 
Along the way, the veterans marched to stirring music provided by the various bands. At the courthouse square, at least 3,000 people watched the pageant pass. The parade was truly the grandest event of the reunion and lasted for almost two hours. Many camps carried flags and the procession was one that Winston-Salem would not forget for a very long time. And here's another view and you see the trolley cars. Uh, following the parade, the veterans were given free rides on the trolleys throughout the city for the rest of the day. Compliments of the Freeze Manufacturing and Power Company. Um, the Lifford and Scales Tobacco Company gave the veterans miniature cl cloth haversacks containing samples of red meat chewing tobacco. Uh, I have one of those uh, surviving haversacks on display here tonight and uh, complete with possibly the only known plug of red meat tobacco. <laughs> I've not found anybody that can show me one of these and I'll, and I'll pull this out in a minute. Anyway, um, let me go ahead and pass that around. Uh, what I have here, uh, I'm not going to open it up and let you see the plug of tobacco, but I have some pictures of it. But this is a miniature haversack that was handed out by Lifford and Scales, and this company was later bought out by RJR. But on the envelope here, you says State Reunion, North Carolina, Confederate Veterans, Winston-Salem, NC, August 19th and 20th, 1908. Compliments of Lifford and Scales, makers of red meat tobacco. And then on the back, um, I may have to sort of move it around a little bit, but on the back it's got a picture of Robert E. Lee uh, with the Confederate flags, and I'll sort of move this around a little bit, but I'll leave it, please leave it in the bag. Um, uh, I have unfolded this, taken the tobacco out, and all the cards inside, there were little complimentary cards with little sayings and stuff on them, and uh, I'll just let you pass that around. Um, the, uh, the tobacco in there is absolutely petrified. It's, you know, the, the little plugs that were like this, and it's got the actual little sticker down in it, you know, that says red meat tobacco. And uh, I don't know if I brought one of those little, you can get those off of eBay every now and for like three or four bucks, you know, but you can't find the, the plug. Um, but um, anyway, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, almost done with the talk, actually. Um, as Thursday, August 20th, came to a close, a simple but memorable closing ceremony was held at the courthouse square. Many of the veterans returned home via train on Thursday evening, but many of them remained in the city until Friday. The Friday morning newspaper, uh, Winston-Salem Journal headline declared, um, oh, okay, now, that's the actual, that's the inside of it. Let me, let me go through this and I'll back up a minute. So. They had uh, these little set of cards inside, and they had, this is both sides of it. There's an acrostic poem, you see Confederate States of America, and different sayings that go with that. And um, I, can, I can make copies of this for you if you like. I've got a, a bigger copy that I've had made that's got all the pieces. So I should have thought to bring you some, but I'll, I'll get you some copies of that that you can hand out to everybody. So you'll see everything on here. But the thing that struck me about this card here is that it's giving all these numbers up here and, and it's like, you know, it's, it's really interesting because you see that, you know, these numbers are pretty close to what we know today. They, they pretty, had a pretty good idea of, you know, the numbers, you know, even then. Um, but if you go through here, I think um, this is the interesting part. More than 43 years have passed. We're talking about 150, but they're talking about 43. <laughs> you know, it's just interesting. But um, the, you'll see this R.D. Mosley. He was in the 5th Virginia Cav. He wrote a lot of poems and stuff, and apparently he donated them. And, uh, some of these poems are really good. I'm not, I'm not going to have time to read through these. But then uh, here's the, the plug of red meat tobacco down here. Just a little picture of that. And you can see the, the little insert that went with it. So um, it's a actually one of a kind. Um, and here's an advertisement from 1907, red meat tobacco. Good enough to eat, right? That's, that's why they call it red meat, because everybody likes juicy watermelon. They were trying to relate to something that everybody really liked. So uh, that was their, 
their slogan, red meat tobacco is good enough to eat. <laughs> so I don't know about that. Okay, well anyway, back to the newspaper. This is a Friday morning, August 21st, the day after it came to a close. The shouting and the tumult ends. The captains and kings depart. The biggest and best state reunion of Confederates comes to an end. Grand reunion comes to a close after two days of pleasure. Free trolley rod, car rides given to soldiers. Veterans unanimous that the reunion was the largest and best ever held in the state. Nothing was left undone. The event left a huge impression on both the visiting veterans and the local, vet, uh, local residents. Praises on both sides rang out in interviews published in the Winston-Salem Journal for weeks. Afterwards, Major H.A. London, Adjutant General of the Division, stated that every veteran will go away full of praise for the Twin City and would only be too glad to come again whenever an invitation was extended to them. Several other North Carolina cities thought hard about hosting the event in the following years for fear of not being able to measure up to the grand event of 1908. The bar had indeed been raised by the efforts of the Norfleet UCV camp and the J.B. Gordon UDC chapter. And the hospitality of the local leaders and business community in Winston-Salem will remain a fond memory of the veterans for years to come. And so ended the reunion. And um, I threw some pictures in here of something you all are familiar with, but it's, it's just really, it's scary to see how close everything's gotten up on this monument now. And uh, that tree there is almost overtaking it. But um, there's another shot I took. I don't know when I took this, but uh, anyway, just imagine that was a big open field at one time and the courthouse set back off, you know, and there was none of this stuff around it. So. Anyway, what's that? Now it's apartments. Yeah, yeah. So, um, anyway, the uh, thing I was trying to do was find a spot back there. I think I, I think I went by it. But anyway, um, there's still a lot of information, and and I have some in the back of the, of this. But uh, if you want to look at some of this, I have. Um, there's some interesting little side articles and things. Uh, some tragic stories. There was one that I didn't put in here that uh, really uh, was really sad, but there was an old fellow that was headed down to the eastern part of the state. And apparently some of these, a lot of these guys couldn't afford to really pay for the train rides, so they just hopped on the trains and rode down. And this one fellow was on his way home, and apparently the train did not stop where he wanted to go, so he tried to jump off, and when he did, he got, he got killed trying to jump off the train on his way back home. So this story, that story is in the, in the journal here too. So there, there was some really interesting, good, sort of funny stories and stuff. I didn't really get to cover all of it, but I tried to keep the, the talk relatively short. But um, I don't know. I can entertain questions if you have any questions. I know some of you, this is your second time around with this thing. But uh, the thing I'm passing around there, if you have any questions about it, um, uh, as far as I know, this, this tobacco pouch is the only one known that has the full everything in it, including the tobacco. Um, someone from R.J. Reynolds is interested in buying it and putting it in a museum now. So I'm going like, what do I eventually do with this thing? I mean, I've got, and I'll tell you how I came across it. It was the odd, odd thing. Um, you just have to be in the right place at the right time sometimes. But um, Myers Auction over here in Yadkin, I never really paid much attention to their auctions, but a friend of mine lives over there in Yadkin. He called me up one day, he says, Greg, you know that bag? And, and what's interesting is, um, let's see if I got it. I had this one first. I just had the bag, and I, and I bought this from the same guy that I bought the badge from a couple of years later. And he was telling me, Greg, these, you don't see these. There are very few of them. And this one is in pretty good shape for what it is. Um, but he said, I don't know what was in it, whether the tobacco was in it or what. And so he's been around a long time. And so um, I was thinking of him when I had the opportunity to buy that. So I went over to the Myers auction. Uh, Dale went with me. And I knew, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll be honest, I'll tell you what I paid for this one. I paid uh, $750 just for this little bag. And it's worth every penny of it, right? So um, I went over there thinking, you know, if I could get that for $750, that'd be a steal. 
thought I had, right? So I go over there not knowing whether I could get the thing or not. So I got over there, they had it on display, it's what I thought it was. They let me open it, look inside, I'm going like, try not to look too excited, you know, put it back in. <laughs> they go back over and I take my chair, get my card, and um, Dale was sitting there with me and he could tell I was really nervous because I really wanted to get this thing, but I said, you know, there's going to be somebody in this room that knows what it is. And obviously it came home with me, right? <laughs> so um, <laughs> I'm sitting there and the bidding starts at 50, 75, 100, then 200, then 300, then 400, then 500, 600. Oh, here we go, you know. <laughs> and I could tell I was sort of in the front of the room and there were two people in the back that were bidding. And um, they got the seven. And the guy looked at me, he says, eight? I said, no, I'm not doing eight. He went around the room, seven, anybody eight, eight? And he looked back at me, he says, 750? I said, bingo. Nobody else bid. I'm going like, ah. Oh. <laughs> he was like, I got it, you know. And Dale looked over at me, he says, you got it. You got it. You know, he just starts talking to me. And so I was just like, I didn't know what to do. So um, um, as soon as the bidding ended, the place erupted in applause and almost got a standing ovation for bidding. Because <laughs> I guess they're not used to people bidding so much money on little bags of tobacco, right? So, um, you know, it's a double, to, it's a tobacco collectible and it's a Confederate thing. So, you know, I, I sort of figured, hey, it's, it's a double whammy for me. I'll, I'll take it. So apparently nobody else wanted to bid higher, but you know, I'm going like, which one would I keep? You know, and so I went back and showed it to Vernon. Vernon was the one that sold this one to me. And uh, I could tell he, he was like, how much you want for it? I said, no, I'm hanging on to it. This is local history. It stays in the Winston-Salem area, right? So, huh? So I bet Vernon did. He, he, you know Vernon Valance, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I could tell he was a little bit, you know, like, oh, I wish I'd have found that first, you know. So, um, but anyway, that's, that's sort of what it is, and uh, I was extremely happy to run across it. And I guess one of these days, when we get enough money to build a, a decent museum, that that'll go in the museum somewhere around here. So um, anyway, that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. So now, there's, there's still some Lifferts playing around uh, here. Yeah, well, I'd, I've been trying to figure out this Lifford and Scales thing, you know. Uh, but they were they were definitely bought out by RJR. RJR was trying to take out all the competition okay. around well, they, Winston. They bought out bidding, you know, the, the bidding the, in Hayes and all those the, guys. The crews the back company in Walker Town. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, yeah. Now there's a, a Bailey and Lifford, it's a pretty good sized firm in Winston-Salem law firm. And I'm wondering if that's... It, it probably does. It is. It is. Uh, I'm sure there's still parts of that family here. Um, Lifford and Scales formed that partnership, and then they, I think they were in business till like 1911, and that's when RJR bought them. And they they kept the Red Meat brand for maybe a year or two, and then then it disappeared. So I don't know. Yeah, yeah, the Winston-Salem downtown. The um, microfish, is, you know, when you go into the, do they call it the North Carolina room still? Or uh, it's that reference room where you go, they, they moved it down to the bottom, but you go in there and down to the left side is where the, the microfish is. And you can just go to the desk and ask them for the 1908 microfish for the Winston-Salem Journal. And you can, you can just slide through all these you know, all the information. And they've got a really funky sort of system, so if you want to try to print it off, you got to sort of play around with it a little bit, but you can eventually figure out how to print what you're looking at. Uh, and yeah. On the microfish monitor, it's, it's a little tough. It's, it's not the best quality, you know, the display itself. So what you do is print, what you print off is actually looks better than the display. <laughs> so um, what I did is, what I've got in here, I print it off, and then I actually scan this stuff in to my computer. That's how I got a digital. Uh, 
Uh, I've, nev I've never, I've never seen any of that over there. But yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Do they have equipment that would even still? Yeah, you can bring that too. Oh, okay. Wow. This is back in the Okay, but I, they probably that stuff probably uh, unless they've turned it into DVD format or something, it probably is gone. You know, it's like my old VHSs. I still got to figure out how to get some of my VHS stuff on. You know. Um, but yeah, the, you know, going over there though, I was really surprised that that they had all that on microfish. And so my next project is to go over there and figure out these other reunions and see what's in the papers for them too, and try to clean out what I can. Oh, oh yeah. These are actual veterans, you know, at the reunion saying this and the paper's quoting them, you know, and they're actually printing that in the paper. That's what, yeah. you know. With this paper putting it in there without editorializing on it, putting like yeah. so-called and, right. and right. he said, you know. But, right. Well, Probably the most of the people who worked in the journal were. Yeah. No Bingo. Yeah. You know, back in those days, everybody yeah. was a Confederate yeah. veteran from Winston Salem. Right. <laughs> there was no problem with getting support because the town was basically all these veterans themselves, all the people that ran the town, you know, so you could imagine, you know, it, no trouble. Chapel Hill was still a, a southern town back then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Imagine that. A long time ago. <laughs> So yeah, it, it's, a, it's a lot of fun trying to dig into this stuff though. Uh, when you start discovering these things, you're rediscovering it is what you're doing. But um, you know, there's all kinds of stuff you can get into if you know where to look. Yeah? It's a little bit off the subject, but I appreciate that because it's hometown. I was reading in the paper about a Reedsville American Confederate statue that's very much like that. Yeah. Very public square somewhere in the back of the center. Right. It's the Confederate Rose Agency to do to save it to that degree. And I keep reading about Arkansas statue, overgrown by that tree. Yeah. Yep. I'm not sure really what's going to happen to it. And, uh, it seems to me that it be part of our mission to keep our eye on it and yep. make sure that yep. it doesn't get buried in some far off cemetery. Right. Now, Jamie and I have had some contact with the ladies of the daughters here, and they actually were the ones responsible for actually getting it on the National Historic Register, uh, which means. Yeah, the, the one here. So they, they actually can't touch this one because it's on the historic register. So as long as Jamie's still around, we're not going to lose the Yeah, that's right. So, <laughs> but that um, does really raise the question of how safe is it from, uh, from a delivery van uh, yeah. driver going to sleep and hitting it? Well, if I'm mistaken, they have they have those uh, protective pilings right there on that yeah. corner. So it's almost yeah. going to have to do some yeah. evasive driving. You, to be you, you really would have to go so out of your way. So it's fairly it, it is. It is. Uh, yeah. that place in the, in the condos or whatever. Yeah. He's really protected it from the work. He's yeah. boarded it up yeah. really well. Yeah. Uh, that's good. I'm they, down every Friday night. They, he's really done a good there, job. There seems to be a lot of interest there locally that to yeah. keep keep it safe. So. It's not out in the middle of a square like the one at Reedsville, which is a good thing, you know. Um, is it back on display now? Which one? The, the Reedsville? Here. No. Here. We, oh. Is it still barred up? The one yeah, here? It, it is. It okay. is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It is. It's, I guess you're going to keep it that way because they finished uh, gutting the building. Right. They've got pipes. They're, they're throwing right. stuff out the windows in the dumpster. It's extremely close by. Yeah, they boarded it up, and I guess. The they had an article uh, in the paper, or they had it on the news talking yeah. about it some, too. They were, real good. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's a good thing. Yeah. Um, right now, about all you can see is the soldiers standing above it. Everything else is boarded up. Right. Okay. Now, I talked with Cindy Casey one time. She's in the, the local chapter of the Daughters, and... Uh, she said they had looked at the monument before 
you know, the, the question come up, should they ever have to move it, would it be safe to move it if, if it ever became in danger and, you know, would, would they have to move it at some point? And I don't think that's a question anymore. But she said when they looked at it, that it, it does have some cracks in it that they didn't think it could survive the move if they even tried. So they have some concerns about even trying to forget that thought, don't even think about moving it because she's afraid that it would. When we moved the lighthouse. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. They, if you can move the Cape Hatteras lighthouse, you can move anything, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Well, if they moved it, it would be the same thing. It would wind up somewhere in a cemetery where nobody yeah. would ever see it again. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Any other questions? I'll, I don't want to keep you all here all night. Okay, I know some of you have seen this before, but, you know. I asked Jamie, I said, are you sure we did this before? I was trying to think. <laughs> so, but, you know, uh, the timing of doing this along with the National Reunion, it sort of makes you think a little bit about, you know, a uh, hundred and some years ago, what it was really like with the actual veterans having reunions versus right. us yeah, that was doing. Yeah, the state the division you know. reunion. You had 2,000 actual veterans there. Right. Whereas we had 2,000 sons at the national, right, and uh, and they talked about the 1899 reunion in uh, in Charleston, and that they had 8,000 veterans march in the parade from uh, Marion Square down King Street. Can you imagine 8,000 actual veterans marching down down the street? What it would have been like to to have been able to stand on the side and watch that go by? Yep. Well, I know, um, well, I'll tell you, a, a guy that was in, that's in our camp, yeah. you, you remember uh, Henry? Yes. Well, he joined our camp, yeah. and uh, not this past time, but 2013, we did our Confederate Memorial Day over at Boonville Cemetery, which is a municipal cemetery there in Yadkin County. And uh, we, we found out that there are 32 buried there in that cemetery, which is the most of any cemetery in Yadkin that I've found so far. So we had this planned out and invited the community and, you know, we didn't have a huge crowd, but there was this older gentleman that came and joined us and he sat there quietly with us and listened to us. And uh, when we got done, you know, we always ask people, you, you know, have any ancestors you want to talk about? And he stood up and he said, one of the fellows that y'all talked about today is my grandpa. Not great grandpa but grandpa. And I was like, wow, James Henry Shore. Hmm. So we found out his grandpa was in the junior reserve. And we, we found out, you know, the junior reserve book just came out and it was timely because we would have overlooked him if we hadn't have seen his name in the book. So then I did some homework and I found out that his grandpa actually saved his captain from being captured because he joined up with the junior reserves down in Salisbury and they marched them over to Camp Vance over there in the Morganton area and that's where Kirk's Raiders came in and they captured about 200 of the junior reserves there. They came in over one. They didn't even have weapons yet. They came in and surrounded them and he helped his captain get away but they put him in a ditch and buried him and covered him up with brush. And that, that, was, that was story was told in the roster book. I was like, holy cow. So when I told that story, he chimed right in and started telling me other stuff along with that story. And I was like, oh my gosh. So, um, that down. well, we're going to interview him. Yeah. He, he's, he's like 89, 90. And we're going to go over to his house. He lives in the house that his grandpa built. He was born in the house his grandpa built. And he lives there today, you know. So it's like, okay, we're going to go over there and interview him in this house. And he's going to talk about his grandpa. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. So uh, we're going to have. And, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, he's in remarkably good health, but that may not stay forever, right? So um, we've actually got uh, in about three weeks. We're we're hoping to get up with him and his son, and uh, do that little interview. And uh, Gordon Myers in our camp has a, a pretty decent little setup, and he's going to come over and. We're going to go over there. Plus, we're going to go over to the other house where he used to live as well and uh, try to capture some of that. He doesn't remember a whole lot about him because he was nine years old when he passed away. 
but uh, he does remember him telling stories of not not of the war, but you know of other things. And then, you know, he had um, talked about several things. Um, now, the interesting thing is we found photos of his grandpa over here in Winston at some of the reunions. <laughs> so, which is really cool. So, uh, we have a, a picture of where we do our memorial over there. The exact same spot. I've seen that and and there's there's like 20 of them sitting there together, all these veterans sitting there, and it's probably from the 1930s, 1920s or 30s, and they got World War One veterans standing there with them, yeah. you know, as guards and stuff. And his name was James Henry Shore. James Henry Shore. And that one, his family came from Bethany, did not? Yeah. That's yeah. My wife's family. Oh, so you 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 have a tie to them. Shore was her great, yeah. Great so there's, there's a bunch of shores all over there in Yadkin, you know, so they'll drive you crazy trying to figure out who all the shores are over there. Okay, cool. Yeah. So um, I get the names mixed up. The, the guy that's in our camp is James Henry Shore, but I'm trying to think of his ancestor's name. It was like Henry Shore or something. That's her grand. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so, Those shores pop up everywhere you go. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, she's been doing a lot of genealogy. Yeah, well, good. Well, um, let me get your email before we leave tonight, and I'll, I'll send you some stuff, okay. you know, that you can pass on to her. And maybe they can make a connection. Yeah, you know. Uh, she doesn't know much about this stuff. Yeah, cool. Okay, I'm going to quit talking. I'm going to sit down. Before you sit down, back. hang on. I got oh. something. Some, uh, um, on behalf of the Precise Rifles, uh, Greg, you have done so much for us, helping us get started and helping give us presentations along with history and, of course, with helping us out here tonight with being our special speaker. Uh, on behalf of the Precise Rifles, we'd like to present you with this oh, okay. certificate well, I appreciate of appreciation. Yeah. And, uh, cool. Like I said, we thank you for everything that you've done yeah. for us. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a passion. You know that. Okay. Well, glad to come out and help any time. Uh, if y'all get tired of hearing me talk, just let me know and you know, <laughs> I'll go back home. Oh.